Hello everyone and good morning. Um, my name is Dave DeFebo. I'm the museum educator here at the National Civil War Museum and I would like to thank you for spending a portion of your morning and the uh, rest of the day here at the museum to see a full slate of some interesting events um, and to also especially see our, our first speaker for today who's speaking on a, a topic that has received, especially in Pennsylvania, a considerable amount of press recently. Um, our, our speaker is Kelly Elaine Navies, and she is the museum specialist in oral history for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. In this position, she coordinates all aspects of the oral history program. She has con been conducting oral history research for over 25 years. Since she was an undergraduate in the African American Studies program at UC Berkeley, her passion for oral history and African American studies carried her into graduate work at UNC Chapel Hill, where she studied at the Southern Oral History program. She later received a master's in library and information science from Catholic University of America with an emphasis in cultural heritage. Navy's oral history projects and interviews are currently located at UNC Chapel Hill Southern Oral History Program, the, Re the Reginald F. Lewis Maryland Museum of African American History and Culture, the Washington, D.C. Public Library, and at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, or NMAAHC. Navy's is a Washington, D.C. resident where she has been residing for the past 15 years. She's also a poet and writer and the mother of a teenage daughter. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Elaine Nades. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming out on a Saturday morning, a beautiful Saturday morning. A million things to do. I'm very honored to be here to talk about Juneteenth today. This is a photo of my great-great-grandmother. We were sitting to the, on the sidelines talking about family history just a second ago. And um, I like to start with her photograph on many of my talks, actually, because she's one of the main reasons I became an oral historian. But that's another story, and maybe we'll have the time to talk about that at the end. But also, because we're talking about Juneteenth, I find it to be um, particularly appropriate. She was born into slavery in Asheville, North Carolina, and lived well into the 20th century. My mother actually knew her. So that close connection to the institution of slavery. Juneteenth refers to the day, June 19, 1865, when General Gordon Granger arrived in Texas with a force of 1,800 troops to issue Order Number 3. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness, either there or elsewhere. Despite the troubling clauses about remaining quietly at their present homes and not being allowed to idle, this was big news to the hundreds of thousands of enslaved men, women, and children who had continued to toil as human chattel in the Lone Star State throughout the war after the Emancipation Proclamation, which had been signed on January 1, 1863, and even months after the official ending of the Civil War in April. Plantation owners had managed to continue business as usual in Texas because throughout the war there had been very little union presence there. The Emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation held no water in Confederate states that did not recognize the authority of the United States government. It could only be enforced with the presence of union troops. For those of the enslaved who did not join the thousands of runaways and, and join the, the Union forces like Sharon's great-grandfather did here, conditions remained largely unchanged, and in some cases even worse due to the pressures of the war. Some owners had to sell their slaves to pay for rising debts, while others uprooted families and moved to more remote places like Texas where they felt more secure maintaining slave labor. 
There were some cases where the enslaved were left in charge of plantations while the owner joined the war effort, and sometimes the enslaved were taken to the front lines where they were put to work in support of a confederacy, mostly doing manual labor. This quote, taken from an interview with a formerly enslaved woman in Arkansas, illustrates the attitude of some plantation owners towards the idea of Union soldiers enforcing the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, you're going to get a kick out of me trying to read the dialect here. <laughs> These are from the interviews um, with formerly enslaved people that were done in the 1930s, the WPA interviews. I have a few excerpts from those, which, of course, are the precursor to the field that I work in, oral history. Them Yankees ain't going to get this far, but if and they do, you all ain't going to get free by them, because I've won free you before that. When they get here, they're going to find you already free, because I'm going to line you up on the bank of Water Art Creek and free you with my shotgun. Anyone miss just one lick with the hoe, or one step in the line, or one clap of that bell, or one toot of the horn, and he's going to be free and talking to the devil long before he ever see a pair of blue britches. So this is what they had to contend with during the war and after the Emancipation Proclamation. <clears throat> it is perhaps difficult for us to imagine the range of emotions felt by enslaved men and women upon learning they were now free. This quote from Felix Haywood, a man enslaved in Texas, gives one perspective. Soldiers all of a sudden was everywhere, coming in bunches, crossing and walking and riding. Everyone was a singing. We was all walking on golden clouds. Hallelujah. Everyone went wild. And this one from Charlotte Brown of Virginia. The news come on a Thursday, and all the slaves been shouting and carrying on till everybody was quiet and peaceful. All at once, old sister Carrie, who was near about 100, started into talking. Taint no more selling today. Taint no more hiring today. Taint no more pulling off shirts today. It stopped down freedom today. Stop it down. These excerpts from the WPA slave narratives offer us a small peek into what the formerly enslaved were thinking and feeling in those moments after the arrival of General Gordon Granger and his 1800 Union troops. And so the first Juneteenth was held a year after the big announcement on June 19, 1866. Oral tradition maintains that a whole hog was barbecued and the color red became a prominent symbol of the sacrifices made for freedom throughout slavery and its aftermath and during the Civil War. As the years went on, freedmen and women of Texas held Juneteenth celebrations despite the obstacles presented by a resistant white power structure that implemented a series of black codes to limit the newly found freedoms of African Americans almost as soon as the Civil War ended. One of those obstacles was having a space in which to gather. Whites attempted to thwart the observance of Juneteenth by denying large groups of blacks access to parks and land on which to celebrate. In response to this strategy, by 1872, only six years after the first Juneteenth, Reverend Jack Yates, a formerly enslaved man who became the leader of the Antioch Baptist Church, formed the Colored People and Emancipation Park Association to purchase a plot of land that could be used for Juneteenth celebrations. Here's the park today. It's gone under numerous renovations um, and had gone into disrepair for several years. This plot of land became known as Emancipation Park, and throughout the era of segregation, it was the only public park open to African Americans in Houston, Texas. Juneteenth continued and even found a home amongst the African Americans who ran south to escape from slavery in Texas to Mexico. To this day, descendants of those um, runaway black Seminoles hold a festival and reunion on June 19th called El Dia de los Negros, or the Day of the Blacks. And yet, even as Juneteenth is spreading throughout the United States, many are just learning about it for the first time, including my Uber driver. He didn't know what I was talking about. He asked me what, you know, what I was coming to do. I said I was coming to talk about Juneteenth. He said, oh, who is that? It was a person. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have known about it my whole life, and yet my family does not have Texas. Back in 1969, my father, Richard E. Navies, who was an activist historian and educator, learned about Juneteenth and decided that we would start to celebrate it when our family moved from Detroit, Michigan to Berkeley, California. For as long as I can remember, summer officially began with Juneteenth, which falls conveniently on the summer solstice. In the weeks leading up to the closest Saturday to June 19th, my father would strongly encourage my brothers and I to begin preparing presentation material for the open mic performance component that is an essential part of our Juneteenth events. 
Thus, I was encouraged to write poems and create dances that spoke to the theme of Juneteenth. We would also choose poetry from the canon of African American literature to recite, such as the works of Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, Claude McKay, and Sonia Sanchez. By the time I was 12, I had other duties as the only girl and the eldest sibling. I was drafted, and I mean that in every sense of the word, there was no choice in the matter, <laughs> to be the mistress of ceremonies for the program. And in the days leading up to Juneteenth, I was in charge of cutting up all the ingredients for the tons of potato salad required for the feast. <laughs> Onions, celery, potatoes, and eggs all day long. Each year would invite my closest friends over to spend the night and assist me with those duties, but for some reason, they usually declined. <clears throat> my brothers had other work. Work, they required them to get down and dirty. They had to clean the yard and do the landscaping and other forms of manual labor needed on our, our hilly Oakland, California property. What was all this for? Why did my St. Louis-born, Detroit-raised father decide to celebrate Juneteenth, a holiday which we have learned originated in Texas? Part of the answer lies in the historical context of the civil rights and black power movements of the late 1960s and early 70s. Juneteenth had actually waned in popularity in the years after World War II. Many African Americans had moved away from the South. They were in the urban centers now, working. It wasn't a holiday. They didn't have the day off. <clears throat> and if, if the Juneteenth would have perhaps disappeared from memory if not for the Poor People's Campaign of 1968. We recently ended a, a year-long exhibition on the Poor People's Campaign at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And this is one of the photographs from that exhibition of the mule train, a mule train headed um, to Resurrection City. Uh, Poor People's Campaign was the last major campaign initiated by Dr. Martin Luther King before he was assassinated that year. Picked up by Marion Wright Edelman, Ralph, Ralph Abernathy, and others, the movement drew activists of all races and creeds from all over the country to a temporary compound built on the National Mall called Resurrection City. Designed to call attention, attention to the issue of poverty throughout America and to demand legislation to address that poverty, the impact of this event is still being assessed today, but one thing that is often overlooked is that the very last demonstration they held was Solidarity Day on June 19, 1968. After Resurrection Day was dismantled, uh, that is the city, the makeshift city that was had been up for several weeks, the activists took their knowledge of June Juneteenth back to their hometowns throughout America. I'm sure that this is probably the way that my father first heard about the holiday in Detroit, where he was a very active person. Like my father, those activists were attracted to Juneteenth for several reasons. At a time of political and social upheaval, and about 100 years after the signing of the Emancipation, Juneteenth offered a way to strengthen community and to highlight three important ideas that lie at the heart of all Juneteenth celebrations. I'm speaking of freedom, of family, of joy. Juneteenth is a living, breathing meditation on the meaning of freedom. What did it mean for four million African Americans to suddenly be declared free with little to no resources, no land, no guarantee of citizenship rights? These are questions that are still asked to this day. Just this past week, in fact, there were congressional hearings on the feasibility of forming a commission to study reparations. No matter where your feelings lie on this matter, it is clear that we Americans are still grappling with the quandary of slavery and the meaning of freedom in this country. Recently, the remains of the Clotilda, the last ship to bring a cargo of Africans, there should be, yes, <clears throat> to bring a cargo of Africans to the United States to be enslaved, were found in Alabama. In a couple of weeks, I will be interviewing an elderly gentleman who knew Cujo. There's a photo of Cujo, one of the Africans brought to Mobile, Alabama on that ship. At the first Juneteenth, there were readings of the Emancipation Proclamation. Today, these questions and more are explored through poetry, song, and other forms of creative expression. These expressions are as complicated as our understanding of freedom itself, at once thankful, but also reflective of the inherent challenges in attaining and keeping that freedom. There's the Emancipation Proclamation. From the beginnings of the transatlantic slave trade and throughout the antebellum period, enslaved Africans suffered disruptions to the family unit. We speak most often of the Middle Passage and the millions torn from their home and families from the African continent, 
But what is less well known is that another million African Americans were torn from their families during the domestic slave trade in which the enslaved were sold from plantations in the Upper South to the New Territory in the New South, to places such as Alabama, Louisiana, and Texas, to supply workers to keep up with the booming cotton industry. Therefore, at the end of the Civil War, we know that one of the primary goals of the freedmen and women was to reunite with family members and to highlight the fact that they had managed to maintain a sense of family and community under unimaginable conditions, where parents did not have authority over their own children and the sanctity of marriage was not recognized. This short quote from a formerly enslaved woman named Caroline Hunter illustrates the vulnerability of a parent-child relationship under slavery. During slavery, it seemed like your children belonged to everybody but you. Many a day, my old mama had stood by and watched Massa beat her children till they bled and she couldn't open her mouth. They didn't only beat us, but they used to strap my mama to a bench or a box and beat her with a wooden paddle while she was naked. Often, families had to be defined. Family had to be defined in ways other than blood. Your family became those who managed to survive and thrive, thrive with you. Juneteenth celebrations honor all of these bonds, those of blood, and those who have earned the titles of brother, sister, cousin, aunt, and uncle through struggle and experience. This is how it is, still is in many black families, including my own. When we moved to California from Detroit, we left our blood kin behind, but over the years we constructed a unit that we actually called the J-19 family. At Juneteenth gatherings, we nurture our children and train them to be the next generation of leaders by putting them in the forefront of the program and giving them special responsibilities. We give thanks for those who have survived and remember those who did not. This is our most recent Juneteenth. So we, now we hold it at my brother's house in Acroquique, Maryland. Um, it used to be in the old days that the men would control the barbecue pit. My father and his friends, uh, would, my father has since passed on, but my father and his friends would stand up one night barbecuing. But now my cousin Aisha has taken it over. She refuses to let me want anyone else barbecue. <laughs> She's great at it, so there she is at work. And um, these are people sitting um, in the, my brother's yard. He has a beautiful piece of land there and watching the program. So this is a photo taken from the stage. Finally, the third but by no means least significant feature of Juneteenth is the pure expression of joy. Though burdened with generations of oppression, it was and is important for African Americans to proclaim that their ability to feel joy has not been suppressed that they can still touch that place in themselves that is grateful to be alive, thankful for the family that survived, for the gift of another day to fight for freedoms that may be just out of reach, for the blessings of faith, community, and the ability to love. Joy is manifested in the making and sharing of an abundance of food centered on the barbecue pit, supplemented by the color red, as in watermelon, red beans, and red soda pop. We usually send out invitations to tell people to bring something red. <laughs> We have everything else. <clears throat> Joy is manifested through the playing of music, singing, dancing. It is not uncommon to hear African drumming or the singing of the African American national anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. You will find each of these elements in Juneteenth celebrations, explorations of the meaning of freedom, a focus on family and children, and pure, unadulterated expression of utter joy. It is no coincidence that Juneteenth is experiencing yet another revival as similarly to the late 60s and 70s, the unresolved issues of slavery, race, and injustice have bubbled to the surface. As part of the domestic slave trade that I spoke of earlier, Jesuit priests at Georgetown University sold 272 enslaved human beings to plantations in Louisiana to cover debt back in 1838. The ghosts of this sale have returned, and Georgetown is leading a field of Ivy League institutions that are coming to terms with their slave-owning past. Americans are searching for ways to come together and heal. Juneteenth, Juneteenth provides a context in which to do that. It is a holiday that all Americans who believe in freedom, family, and joy can rally around. At the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, it is our mission to tell the story, uh, the American story, through an African American lens and to create a space for healing and reconciliation. As the coordinator of our growing oral history program, I am acutely aware of the significance of capturing the stories of African Americans at this moment in time. These stories will be just as important to future historians and thinkers as the WPA slave narratives, 
then the 1930s that I've been quoting in this talk are to historians now. In the spirit of Juneteenth, let us never forget the sacrifices made so that we have the luxury to experience freedom and to interrogate its evolving meanings. Let us celebrate our families and children and let us express our joy to be alive and in the company of like minds and hearts. I have a few more slides. This is from, if you haven't been to the museum, how many of you have been to the National Museum? Just a few, so we invite the rest of you to come on down. This is um, a cabin that we brought to the museum from Edisto Island um, in South Carolina, and we had to take it down and rebuild it. So if you come to the museum, you will see it inside. And this cabin, um, was lived in um, by enslaved people, but it was lived in all the way into the mid 20th century, until the 1980s. And so we actually brought the last family that lived into the, in this home to the museum, and I got a chance to interview them. And here's a photo of Emily Maggett look, looking, Maggett looking inside the home at the museum. Um, she was married to, her husband grew up in this home with 10 other siblings, actually. And they had no idea at the time that it had been lived in by actual enslaved people. So to them it was just home. It was fascinating um, to interview them, actually. And the home never had running water or, uh, or electricity. So I would like on that note, thank you very much. Thank you.